All right, I believe we're live now. Thank you, Ben, for getting this set up for us a month ago. Uh, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. Oh, by the way, we are broadcast live before a live virtual audience, so bear that in mind. Uh, now we just need a laugh track for my jokes, and everything will be We're fine. it! Oh, that's great. My son doesn't think I'm funny. So. Yeah, my daughters don't think I'm funny either. <laughs> Yeah, he watched a little bit of the podcast one time. He's like, Dad, you're laughing at your own jokes. And I was like, well, yeah, they're funny. Anyway, our guest today is Les Klinger. Hey, Les, how you doing? Great. Great to be back on the show. Yeah, glad to have you. Really enjoy talking with you. Um, let's do, well, first of all, very important. Rick Lay, it is his birthday today. Happy birthday, Rick. Happy birthday, Rick. Thank you. It couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Do you Rick. have cake for us all? Uh, Noah, it's a cake for my family. I'm I'm just happy he's on the show today, uh, on his birthday. So that's dedication. Um, let's do intros, and then we'll talk to to Les. Uh, I'm Mike Davis with Lovecraft Easing. I don't actually know what my job title is, but let's move on to uh, Heather. Uh, Heather Landry. I'm an artist, and my stuff's at samproperties.com. Pete. Uh, Pete Rock, I write horrible things and I watch terrible movies so that you don't have to. You do watch a lot of terrible movies. I, watch I don't a think lot you write of horrible things, but you watch terrible movies. I watch terrible movies. Oh, God. The Lost of Pastor. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. The Lost of Pastor. Uh, uh, ben. I'm Ben Handelman. I am literally studying crime and mystery fiction at Pasadena City College. All right. And then Rick. Rick Lay, I write articles on the pulps and uh, occasionally fiction. So, um, thanks, Les, for having your people send me this, the the new annotated HP Lovecraft. Appreciate that. Um, and they also sent me a couple papers about it. And the second page is uh, about Les Klinger, and it's really, really long. So... <laughs> <laughs> well, let's not waste the show on you've that. done a lot of things. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm going to let you introduce yourself instead. How, how's that sound? Oh, great. Okay. Well, right. uh, by day, a lawyer. By night, a uh, an annotator editor. Uh, it's now 42 books, uh, if you count things like the Shaw Comes Reference Library as 10, uh, and uh, Sandman is four, and so on. So, it's a, you know, it's a little generous count, but it's it's getting up there uh, on a wide variety of subjects, uh, comics, mystery, vampire literature, horror fiction, crime fiction, history, crime writing, geeky stuff. So, uh, okay, so uh, a list of things you've annotated would be, you said before we started the show that Sandman is coming up, right? No, Sam, Sandman is out. Four I'm sorry, not Sandman, uh, American Gods, pardon me. American Gods will be out in March. Um, uh, and uh, of course, the latest is uh, is the second volume Here's of annota annotated Lovecraft. Um, the uh, so the list would be Sherlock Holmes, Dracula, Frankenstein, Lovecraft, uh, Sandman, Watchmen. Wow, those are the, those are the big ones. Oh, and and classic American crime fiction, five novels in that volume. Um, yeah. Classic American crime fiction, nineteen twenties of the nineteen twenties. Amazing, thank you. Well, the the book is beautiful. The new annotated H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions, and I know all all these guys have a lot of questions for you too. So uh, I'm not going to monopolize the show. Uh, Ben's questions are probably going to be more in depth than mine anyway. So, uh, but this is a beautiful, beautiful hardcover book. Um, I I do have a question. They sent me this, the first one, and yes, and it's an it's an arc, an advanced review copy is. Maybe this is a dumb question, but is this what it looks like? Is it is it soft cover or is it hard no? It's a hard cover. It's hard cover, like the second one. It's hard cover. There it is. Um, I'm not sure why they sent you the arc, except they're being cheap. Jeez. Uh, so <laughs> no, the hard cover came out in 2014. It's right. 22 stories. Um, I called it sort of the Arkham cycle. Thank you, Pete. That was lovely. Vanna yes. White kind of moved there, uh, and. Um, 
it was the uh, it's the 22 Arkham related stories. Uh, we sort of ran out of room. It's 900 pages uh, because it includes the two two of the of the quote novels, uh, At the Mountains of Madness, and uh, and Charles Dexter Ward. Uh, and um, they I was back visiting Norton in uh, 2017, and they said, you know, this is doing really well. Are there more stories? And I said, "You bet. There's more that we had to cut." Um, so they said, "Well, why don't you do a second volume?" So what the one you were holding up, uh, which I subtitled "Beyond Arkham" because it's not the Arkham stories, yeah. uh, is another 25 stories, including some of the ones that it broke my heart to cut from the first one, uh, "The Outsider," "Rats in the Wall," uh, and it also includes uh, "Dream Quest." It, am I wrong about this? When I had you on when it came out, which I guess is what five years ago, yes, uh, we, we we were all like, "Les, you got to do another one," and you're like, oh, "I don't know if I want to do that." And uh, well, <laughs> I always want to do it. It's, <laughs> uh, I try and be polite instead of saying, you know, it's a man. These darn publishers, you know, I love my publishers, but they want to make money, and so their question always is, sure. "Do we think the books sell?" <laughs> So the first volume, I must say, I mean, the fans, uh, it, well, way beyond what we would think of as the Lovecraft community has bought that book to my great delight. And um, so it's been very, very successful for Norton. And yes, they wanted to do a second volume. What would you say, I don't mean this in any negative way at all. What would you say is the difference between these, the annotations with these and Joshi's Veoriums? That's a very good question. Well, the Veoriorium is not an annotated book. The Veoriorium is Veoriorium, or your rum, is simply the original stories with very carefully curated text and notes about every single textual variation in all of the editions. There is no commentary on the story. Ah, uh, okay. That makes sense. But ST has published three paperback volumes of annotated stories. Um, it's only about maybe 12 or maybe 15 total stories, I think. Uh, maybe maybe 17 or 18, I've lost count. Um, and I certainly am very familiar with those books and read them very carefully. The big difference between my book and my books and his are, I mean, not, I'm not saying it's a positive necessarily, ST's annotations are all ST's thoughts about mm. the stories. My annotations, I have tried to go far broader and include commentary from uh, a, a variety of sources, including wonderful articles in Crypto Clue, articles in uh, Lovecraft Studies, Lovecraft Annual, books about Lovecraft, and so on. Uh, ST is a brilliant, brilliant scholar. He's been a good friend. He's been very supportive of my work. Um, but he's not the only guy with an opinion on the stories. Right. Uh, hey, let me open one this of, up and let you guys ask some questions. Well, one of the things that I like about the annotations that Les has done is that he'll present somebody's co uh, commentary with the proper citation so that you can go back and read it yourself, but then he'll call it out and say, I don't agree with this because and because of this. And I think that's very valuable for scholarship that you know you're going to present somebody's argument and then you're going to call you're going to back up and say but i disagree because of this and not a lot of scholars do that i find that very refreshing for this book thank you i mean my aim is i'm mean, sort of dual aims of what i'm trying to do in notes one is first of all i'm not an academic so I'm a lawyer, so I am try to be careful about citations and quotations and all that. But um, you know, and I'm, I'm not an academic, and frankly, I, I serve on the uh, board of advisors for the Journal of Dracula Studies, and half the papers we get are written in such academic gobbledygook that you can't <laughs> read them. I mean, they're just if if you're another. Uh, PhD student in the field of English literature or whatever, and you want to talk about, uh, um, you know, deconstruction theories, et cetera, et cetera. This doesn't interest me. It just doesn't interest me. 
Uh, so I tried to stay away from that. At the same time, I'm always looking for material to include where the reader will go. That's really cool. I didn't know that. Um, and it's sort of the combination of what have other people said and are there things that we can add to, you know, enjoy, make it more enjoyable, more interesting. And I think that that's one of the main hooks, for lack of a better term. Uh, you know, hey, I didn't know that about this. This is really interesting, you know. Um, and as opposed to just reading the text without that. Um, what did you do first? What, what, what was your first annotation? Um, well, the story, I mean, it's part of the story of how I got to be a writer. Um, I was a Sherlockian from the days of law school. I, I received from uh, my girlfriend at the time a gift of uh, Baring Gould's annotated Sherlock Holmes, which is sitting up there, my first copy of it and um, was absolutely hooked by the cult of Sherlock Holmes, um, the idea that people were doing all this amateur scholarship, and the idea that people were writing footnotes about it. I mean, that turned me on. Uh, and I thought someday, maybe when I was old and gray, uh, I would be the person who got to update the Baringold edition. Well, flash forward uh, almost 30 years, and um, one too many times I said to my wife, what are we doing this weekend? And she said, you have all those books, meaning mostly those, some of those, uh, said, why don't you go write something? And so I did, I started to write, uh, Rick is very familiar with this kind of stuff, the articles that appear in the Baker Street Journal and other Science Society publications essays about little aspects of the Sherlock Holmes stories. And then I said, you know what, I'm going to try doing the updating of Baring Gould. And I started to do a couple of stories, uh, showed them to some friends. Um, I got a lot of criticism about it, with good criticism. And those turned into uh, the reference, the Sherlock Holmes reference library that I think Ben mentioned earlier, or someone mentioned. Uh, uh, and I was about five volumes into that when I got a call from a senior editor at Norton saying uh, we're going to redo the old Baron Gould. Uh, we hear you're the person who should edit the new edition. Wow, nice. I picked myself up off the floor <laughs> and said, uh, me? I'm a lawyer in Los Angeles. You know, I've never had a real book published. I, mean, I love the reference library, but it's a small press. Uh, aimed at the Sherlockian market, which means it's been a huge seller, by the way, in the Sherlockian market. Over 20, almost 25 years, I think we've sold 500 copies. So, uh, you know, that that's the Sherlockian niche market. Um, so uh, anyway, that's how it got started. So Sherlock Holmes was the first uh, major annotation that I undertook. Uh, before we move on from Sherlock Holmes, and guys, please jump in with questions. But I, I believe I saw something that you were a consultant on the two Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock movies. Is, is that correct? Well, did you like them? Uh, I liked them. My favorite is Jeremy Pratt. You know, there's always different interpretations. I understand. Well, if you like them, I, you know, they took my advice about so many important things. If you didn't like them, you know, well, they ignored you. Truth <laughs> is, technical <laughs> advisors largely get ignored. So, uh, but no, I, it, it, I sort of wormed my way in on the first one. A mutual friend introduced me to the producer. Uh, the producer didn't want to have anything to do with me. Another mutual friend introduced me to somebody who was up to direct the picture. Uh, I helped him. He didn't get the gig as a director. Uh, and then Robert Downey called me out of the blue uh, because a friend had said to him, Klinger lives in your hometown of Malibu. He's the world's greatest expert on Sherlock Holmes. Nice. Uh, he called me and I worked on the first picture. Uh, and then I got officially engaged as a technical advisor for the second one. And hopefully there will be a third one. I've also been the technical advisor on a couple other uh, films. Uh, a an unproduced Sherlock Holmes film that was being made in Dubai. Um, I'm a technical advisor for the new Enola Holmes film. Uh, I was almost involved in uh, Sherlock Gnomes. Uh, they talked to me and then went their own way. And I've been a consultant on a lot of comics. Um, Sherlock Holmes Year One, 
uh, the John Reppy and Leah Moore comics, Liverpool Demon, uh, Trial of Sherlock Holmes, a couple others, uh, Tony Lee's uh, Sherlock Holmes Baker Street Regulars, etc. I love doing this technical stuff because yeah. um, I'm not a very creative person, uh, and this is my, and I, but I love stories, so to have even the tiniest hand in making stories maybe better, maybe more a little more authentic is really joyful. You know, I'd like to jump in on that. Um, so a professor at my college, she actually wanted me to ask you about, you know, Sherlock Holmes and, you know, he's the most ad adapted. I don't know if that's the right word. Yes. Yeah. Like there's more films about him than even Jesus, right? Absolutely. And um, just curious your thoughts on adapting him, you know, a character that's so well known a lot of the preconceived notions about Sherlock Holmes don't match the original stories. Um, I know for decades, you know, Watson's a bumbling idiot because of the uh, movies in the forties, for example. Um, and there's so many different interpretations and different ways to adapt the stories. I'm just kind of curious your thoughts about, you know, uh, so the Robert Downey Jr. films go one direction. Um, the Benedict Cumberbatch TV show is, you know, it's modern, but it also goes a different direction. The Jeremy Brett series went a different direction. Just curious what your thoughts are on, on when shows do that or kind of do their own thing. Um, we we now have a science society called Doyle, Doyle's Rotary Coffin, referring to him turning over in his grave. Uh, <laughs> and, and uh, I mean, basically the premise of that group and my personal feelings are, you know, there are many rooms in our father's house. There's no bad Sherlock Holmes. If people come at it from the point of view, they love the stories and then they do their own thing. Uh, we're, we're really in a golden age of adaptations. You didn't mention uh, CBS's Elementary, uh, which is now the most hours ever filmed about Sherlock Holmes. Um, and uh, we have the Japanese uh, uh, anime, uh, Miss Holmes, um, going on right now. Um, and, and there's just been a Sherlock Holmes in the 22nd century, a wonderful children's cartoon. I remember that one when I was a kid. You also have a video game series that's been going for 20 years now that's very popular. Right, the Frogware series, yes. Very, there's just... Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, the character is, in a sense, plastic. Um, in a sense, I mean, so iconic that you can do many things with the character. And Rick, I know that you have devoted some personal effort to sort of using the character in different stories and settings. I wanted to ask you, um, when you did the annotations, you adopted a different approach in Baron Ghoul. He uh, created a chronology of the stories and put them in chronological order where you put them more in the order they were, co they were collected. Yeah. It was. I find Baron Gould um, annoying, really annoying, to try and figure out where a story is in that book. You you have to use the table of contents to see sort of where he plopped it. His chronology is interesting. Um, back in the I want to say the eighties, I think Andy Peck and I did um, together an update of the amazing uh, job that he had done solo before. It's a little collection called The Date Being. Um, and it looks at all of the chronologies. I think we're up to now 18 or 19 different chronologies, studies of the actual dates on which the events of, of the cases took place. Just a um, real quick question. Is there a place to find your chronology? Because I know it's one I've tried to look for and it's... Well, it's in a book. I mean, you can find it. Uh, there are copies available. I personally still have some copies left. If, if you want one, Ben, uh, yeah. email me and I'm happy to sell you a copy. I think we sold them for 20 bucks or something. Uh, sure. I mean, it's it's it was a tiny press uh, in the first place. Um, but... I, I did reproduce some of that material in the Norton volumes, some of the material in the sense of I created a table for each story that showed sort of what the different chronologists thought about the relevant dates. Uh, Baron Gould is an interesting chronologist, but he's just one, and there are many others. And, and for him to impose his chronology on uh, readers was a little presumptuous, but hey, he was William Baron Gould, so he could presume. It also uh, was difficult to read his, those stories in the supposed chronological order. There's a. Have you read uh, June Thompson's biography, Holmes and Watson? 
I think I, I did a long time ago. It's really, it's very good. Um, it's it's much more uh, analytical than Baring Gould's Shaw Comes of Baker Street. Um, and it has its own chronology, but she spends a lot of time on sort of the psychology of the characters and, and, and the personality changes that we see over the years in the characters. Uh, it's really well done. June Thompson's Holmes and Watson. Did she write several pastiche volumes as well? She did, yes. All right, then, then I did read it. It's been a while since I read Jim Thompson. Before we move on from Sherlock Holmes, I just wanted to say, you mentioned the the CBS uh, series, and I I didn't think I would like it. And I started watching the, the, the episodes, and it was a very interesting show. It just ended. What so, they got right is what it, it, to me, is the most important part of it, and that is the friendship. Right. And, right, you know that—that's why we love Sherlock Holmes. We love spending time with Holmes and Watson, and um, and the CBS show I thought really did it well in a, in an unusual way with a female Watson. And when when we premiered the show, we premiered the show at um, a Baker Street Regulars conference called uh, Behind the Canonical Screen that we did at UCLA. And Rob Doherty, the showrunner, and I did an onstage uh, interview, conversation for about an hour. And I said to him at one point, promise me, Rob, no kissing. Yeah. Watson, Watson will not kiss. And he said, no, I don't see that ever happening. And thank goodness he stayed true to that for the whole seven seasons. Yeah. I, 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 last thing I'll say about that show, if you if anyone listening who has not seen it, there are some very, very interesting twists that you just – you you just do not see coming in the right first especially the first season yes yes absolutely so. i would say the first and the the casting is um how, i mean I, I john moreland as as uh holmes's father i mean wow i yeah. i remember being skeptical when they cast lucy Liu. i just i didn't know what the show was going to do and she she was better in that than anything i ever saw her in she was um, great and I would argue her relation, you know, uh, the Holmes Watson relationship in there. I would put that in like the top three of any adaptation. I think that's right. My, I, I will say you didn't ask, but my, my favorite Watson sort of alone um, is Jude Law. Um, I just think he had sort of all the right dynamics. You could tell this man is smart and fearless and and strong, and he stands up to Holmes. And my favorite scene in, in the films is um, with that. It's a great scene in the stories. Is where Holmes says to Watson, "Watson, you have the grand gift of silence." And in the film, I don't know if you remember, they're riding in a carriage, and he says that to Watson, and Watson looks at him and punches him in the nose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, and I, I, sorry, Ben, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that's one of my other favorite Holmes Watson comedy. I thought I would hate Robert Downey Jr. and uh, I don't think he's he's a, the best Holmes, but the relationship they had between Holmes and Watson in those movies I thought was absolutely perfect. Uh, I was going to ask before we moved on, Les, who your favorite Holmes is. I have to go with Jeremy Brett. Thank you. Uh, I, I just and 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 <laughs> partly it's the script, partly, partly it's just that Brett invested so much in that character, and and you can just see, you know, the the wheels turning in his head about sort of. Being, being Holmes, being the over-the-top, emotional, bohemian, brilliant, off-putting, prickly genius. Cumberbatch, I found too prickly. Even, di even dying like at it. the end, uh, Jeremy Wright, even he was dying at the end and he gave it everything. Yep. Yeah, and I, w I would agree about Cumberbatch. Um, to me, I, I mean, I, I really hated that line about, oh, I'm a high-functioning sociopath, not a what, you know that whole thing. I just that's not the that's not the Sherlock Holmes of the stories is, and I think it's a an inferior version of the character. Mark Gatiss is great. Um, Stephen Moffat's a very smart man. Uh, the casting was interesting. Martin, Martin Friedman obviously is a wonderful actor, but it just never. I mean, I, I did a lot of commentary about it. PBS actually asked me if I would do what what I ended up calling tweet notes, uh, live Twitter commentary on the episodes as they aired, and it was a lot of fun to do. Um, but it was never my favorite. I'm sorry to say. Yeah. Um, so, sort of in relation to you know, cause, uh, not not to stay on Sherlock Holmes forever, but you're also such a giant in the field. It's hard to not talk about some of these subjects. Um, 
the way you do the annotations, and I know you're not the first uh, Sherlockian to sort of handle things this way, but it's a very in-universe, um, what, what's it called, the great game, right? Like the idea of- Absolutely. The, oh, I'm the, far from the first, far from the first. Yeah. And, and there are some who don't like that. I mean, the Sherlock Holmes annotations never break the fourth wall. I mean, they are all written on the assumption that these stories are true. Uh, Holmes and Watson really lived, um, and that's the approach. Um, in, in other books, I've sort of gone back and forth between that point of view. Lovecraft, for example, and we'll get to that. Um, Dracula, I tried it that way, too. Um, and um, some people really hated it. That well, I, I, I think that's the audience difference, because I loved how you did the Dracula annotations. I thought it was brilliant. And it made it more enjoyable, uh, you know, because Dracula is the, is it the second most adapted character and yes. that's his character, yeah. right? So yeah. these are the top two, right, that you're handling. I'm waiting for your annotated uh, New Testament next. <laughs> so we can we can handle that one. It's not um, as easy to do the humor in that one, I think. Not. Oh, well. But the um, the way you handled it in Dracula and also in Frankenstein, um, I loved it. I, I think that makes it more enjoyable because it's, as the Sherlock Holmes fans, you know, the Sherlockians say, like, you're playing the game. It's part of enjoying the stories. Well, thank you. Yeah, in Frankenstein, for example, I ended up worrying about things like, how did the creature learn to read by watching somebody else learn to read? That's a unique talent. Uh, and it just bothered me. Well, Frankenstein's a very early story, but I think the positives outweigh the negative and your annotations oh, no question. certainly help no, with that. No question about it. It's a brilliant book. It's an, especially when you, even if you don't say to yourself, this is written by a 19 year old. Uh, Uh, moving on to Lovecraft before we get into the annotations. Can I, can I just ask one yes. last question about Dracula? Go ahead, Rick. Because we asked who your favorite Holmes is, who's your favorite Dracula? Wow. Uh, again, sort of based on the script, it has to be uh, Louis Jordan. I love the BBC wow. production of that. I don't know that he's the best Dracula, but it's the best production. Um, because it's so true to the original. And you're talking uh, about the 1970s BBC production, not the right. 2000s one. Right. Oh. Uh, I don't know. I think, you know, Jack Palance is way up there as, as Dracula. Uh, he just, in the, in the, uh, uh, it, it's so that, that one also, that particular um, film also appeals to me because it was the first one that played with the idea that there was a, pre-existing connection between Dracula and I've forgotten if it's Lucy or Mina in that one but a pre-existing condition uh, connection which is that she's the reincarnation of his lost wife uh, and uh, that was uh, that was the doing of the screenwriter who also wrote Dark Shadows by the way yeah well, it was stolen from Dark Shadows he stole it from himself yes uh, <laughs> So, um, you know, those, I mean, but there's there's some wonderful directors, but I'm very fond of the Louis Jordan ver version. I, I would agree with you that that's the best. I mean, certainly the closest version. Um, I want to say James Rolfe uh, just did a YouTube video earlier this year that compared like 30 different versions of Dracula to find which was the closest to the book, and that one won by a good margin. Yeah, um, I saw just, that too. It's just hard for me to overlook Christopher Lee because he's so... Oh, yeah. So, so good. I mean, just the first film... We can ignore the others uh, as far as the writing goes. Where, where did Frank Langella rate on that, Ben? You know, I, 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 not very highly on my list, but I don't know about this other list. But <laughs> do we want to talk about Max Shrek? Now there's a Dracula. <laughs> I, I mean, he's he's it's it's a brilliant interpretation of the story. I don't know how true it is to the novel. Oh, it's way. not very true at all, but it's, you know, it's, uh, well, but, but, but if you go back to the book, remember, Dracula is an old man, mm -hmm. he has long fingernails, hair on his palms, this sort of unibrow and all that, he's not uh, uh, Gary Oldman, he's not a good looking guy, uh, and so uh, the pretty boys are sort of wrong in the beginning, that's why Louis Jordan, um, that's the only criticism I have. He's much too pretty. Um, you know, Shrek is just what I really depict. Sort of, there's a rat-like creature. And, and we should be clear that Max Shrek probably had the biggest impact of. Good question. I mean, 
No, I, I would argue that Nosferatu may have had a bigger impact on the genre than even the original novel. I mean, the whole idea of vampires being vulnerable to sunlight came from that film. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and it's it's a brilliant, I mean, I, everyone agrees it's a brilliant, brilliant, you know, film. Uh, it's just, if you're looking specifically at who it adapts the novel best, it was that BBC production that really came. I, I agree. you can, I mean, we're talking an epistolary novel. It's not uh, It's not the most readable thing in the world, even though it's one of my favorites. Well, it's very difficult. Yeah. It's it's not readable if you come to it with the expectation that it's the movie. No. But if you read it, I mean, the first time, I think I probably read it before I'd even seen the movie. I, I don't, I can't say for sure, but I read it in college, and I just remember it scared the crap out of me. I mentioned to Ben before the show uh, that recently I reread it uh, because I listened to it on Audible. Audible has a full cast mm. version of it and I don't mean that it's an Audible play. I like Audible dramas, but this is not an Audible drama. This is a reading of the novel exactly as it is, but you know, each letter, each person talking is a different character and is so well done. <laughs> If you, if you want to hear a really interesting take, by the way, dig yeah. up, you'll find it somewhere on YouTube, I'm sure, uh, Orson Welles, a Mercury Theater adaptation of Dracula. Yeah. Well, uh, I have it, Mike. Dracula. Mike, I have it. I can send it to you. It's uh, great. Yeah, it's... <laughs> well, you know, I, mean, I like that stuff, so... <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, and that gets me to another topic I want to bring up was audio drama. Sherlock Holmes is, the, again, there, he's easily the most... I, I, I think at one point, 10 years ago, we had three different current adaptations going at once well and then there's the radio shows too i mean you're well, talking but that's what i'm talking seven, about like seven or eight hundred radio shows you there's know? also an audio drama of uh sherlock holmes versus dracula since we're there's since there's we're three of them this. there's three, there's of three them? different sherlock holmes versus dracula audio dramas oh, no kidding one's an adaptation of a novel by lauren uh, eshelman eshelman, eshelman. Yeah. Yeah. there's one that's an adaptation of a novel called the tangled sky and whose author i can't remember David it was done Stewart by big davies Bruce. It's your days, and there's a, there's a third one that I'm forgetting. And I know there's a the, third one. Uh, the uh, it's by Dan Stashower, and it's called The Adventure of the Sanguinary Count. Yes, Sanguinary Count. Yes. So there's, I mean, this is. Uh, so I have literally uh, probably close to a thousand radio dramas or audio dramas between Big Finish, the BBC productions, the old school NBC um, uh, blue. What is it? Blue Radio Network, whatever it was in the, back in the 30s, the Basil right. Rathbone series. Blue Network, yes. Blue Network. There's so much there. And I feel like that's an area of Sherlock Holmes that's not really that deeply explored. Um, at least I've not been able to find much about it. Um, I think you're right. There's a couple of books um, some by some of the people involved. Uh, Dennis Green, I think, wrote uh, was involved with one of the books uh, and so on. Back mainly about the NBC radio show. Yeah, but there's been so much since. I mean, there there's, has, uh, absolutely. And, I and then there's the readings. Point. I mean, there's wonderful readings. I mean, there's Basil Rath there's Basil Rathbone. There's a there's a, a phonograph record of Basil Rathbone. Um, there's of course the recent Stephen Fry reading. Um, you know, you have Douglas Wilmer reading the canon and so on. Uh, wonderful audio readings. So, yeah, it's it's just this is a you know considering how popular the character is, I'm surprised that no one's really. I mean, you had was it Imaginary Theater? I think it was like a small. Midwestern right. radio station did like yep. 400 episodes. Okay, well, do it, Ben. Who's, oh, who's holding you back? Oh. <laughs> I don't. I don't have the access. You too but... can sell 200 or 300 copies of a book. Hey, I'm one of those two or 300 copies. Thank you very much. I own some of your reference library. Thank you, you. Used it in a class. Thank you. you. Used it in an actual academic setting. Uh, my favorite story, I, uh, so a, a client came to see me. He's been a client now for probably 15 years. He walked into my office, and this is long before. No, it must be longer than that. This was probably back around 2002 or 2003. Walked into my office, looked at the movie posters, which are all Sherlockian posters on my wall, and said, oh, my God, you're that less clinger. <laughs> now, this was when the reference library was the only thing I'd ever published. And so you can understand sort of the coincidence that this was one of the guys who had one of the 200 copies. Wow. Well, so uh, just for the we hell should of probably it. Get to, I yeah. was going to say, um, the one other thing I wanted to ask is, uh, so I, I met you at Necronomicon. Um, you were on a panel with uh, Victor Laval, who's um, possibly the greatest living writer. Great, great writer. 
Um, if you haven't read, here's a plug for Victor. If you haven't seen the latest issue of Weird Tales, read his story, Up From Slavery. It is fabulous. It is. I, I just purchased it. Uh, Matt Carpenter talked about it um, two weeks ago, I think it was. And But, I mean, I remember talking to Victor at Necronomicon, and he brought it up, and it was... Well, you need to have him on the show. And what about Matt Ruff? Have you guys had him on the show? Uh, yeah. I emailed Matt. I haven't heard back from Matt. I, uh, Victor wants have... to be on the show, and he's so busy that he sometimes just doesn't get to that email. But I know I he wants to be on the show. <laughs> so I just finished get... reading Lovecraft Country. I'm sorry it took me so long to get to it. I was blown away. Yeah. So we just got to get him scheduled. I know he wants to be. And he told Ben at Necronomicon that he wants to be. Yeah, and so. we had Matt Ruff on uh, just about a year ago. Yeah, great. Talked to him about this. We did. Great. Yep. Yeah, we did. Oh, okay. Yep. I'm, 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 yeah, you know. Yeah, because <laughs> there you go. No, did, but uh, did I do I a mean, good I, job interviewing him? You did. It was great. <laughs> oh, you guys were brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> but I know, like, I wrote a paper, you know, on Lovecraft Country and the the Ballad of Black Tom because they're so. I I mean, somehow they took the worst thing about Lovecraft and turned it into a great cosmic horror element of a story it was i mean i mean victor laval's the ballad of black tom is i don't even know what to compare it to it's i mean how do you take the worst story of a writer and make it one of the best stories the last decade or more yeah it's it's brilliant so i was curious you know being at Necronomicon, you were on several panels how, how was that how was you know sort of it's going through fun. these topics it's great fun this is my uh fourth fourth time uh 13 15 17 and 19 yes um, so the first time I was there, I had nothing published um, about Lovecraft, and yet um, everybody was very generous and supportive of the idea. They were excited. They hadn't seen anything yet. They didn't know how good or bad it was going to be. Uh, in 15, I was there as a guest of honor because the book had come out by then, and that's what, that's what you do, I guess. Uh, and I was just so touched by the support of the community for I mean, because in the Lovecraft universe, I see myself as still uh, a newbie. Uh, you know, I'm not one of the folks who was around in the 70s when Lovecraft sort of came to blossom, and there was a uh, there was a real uplift of uh, of critical appraisals of him and publications about him and so on. Um, so I came to this very late, and I was very very appreciative of the community support. Uh, I enjoyed Necronomicon a lot. I, I love being on panels. I love to hear myself talk. I never know what I'm going to say, but, you know, I, uh, and uh, and it's a lively group. I'm sorry that ST has kind of dropped out. Um, you know, he's a strong voice, uh, sometimes a controversial voice, but always fascinating and obviously a brilliant man. I have to say I was I was at one of your panels, and I was very impressed with how you – handled moderating some panelists that didn't want to let others speak is, is maybe a polite way to, I don't want to bash anybody that's not here, but yes. I was really impressed with how you were able to handle, because I would have, there's a reason I'm not on any of those panels. Ben only bashes people who are here, so. Okay, well, and, well and, it's, no, I've done a lot you. of moderating. I've, I've been a moderator, I've been on a lot of panels at mystery conventions and so on over the years. And probably half the time I'm the moderator, and I like it. I enjoy doing it because you're not surprised when you're the moderator. Nobody certainly leans over and says, "So, Les, what do you think about that?" You know, it's me doing that, and um, and it's also sort of being a conductor. Yes, I try and make sure everybody's points of view get across and all that. Um, yeah, I I fun. did a lot of moderating in Economic on uh, and the past few years. I, was, I thought I was doing a great job, and I think I was. And then Alan Dean Foster was on, on one of them, and uh, I was talking, and he interrupts me. He goes, "That's not how you moderate a panel." <laughs> and I'm like, "Okay, Alan, you're the moderator now." <laughs> Did you go, Ben, to the panel on Stephen King? I missed that one. I was at the obscure panel. I wish I so yeah. that the problem is Necronomicon. Amazing. It's hard to find on Necronomicon what panels or when. I know. And it was amazing. It was a panel about, I mean, it started out as basically sort of the Lovecraftian elements of Stephen King and then segued into a much bigger discussion about Stephen King as a writer and horror and sort of where we're going and what makes for good horror writing these days. 
uh, and it was really, it was very lively. Uh, Victor was on the panel. Um, I can't even remember all the opinionated folks on the panel, but it was very good. And I think it's around somewhere on somebody's website, an audio of it. And uh, Ben, didn't you, we talk about it recently too? I, because Matt, I think uh, Matt and I, Pete, were you, did you make that panel? I did not. I think I was moderating a different panel. So, yeah. I think Legends of Tabletop recorded a bunch of them. Hmm. Okay. Yes, that's who it was. Yeah, because exactly uh, my, my wife got sick on the second day, and I sort of had to abandon the convention for a while. And uh, Yeah, so it, it was Legends of Tabletop. And, boy, you can catch it. I mean, it was just I started out the panel saying to myself, I'm not going to have much to say here. You know, I've read two or three. I'm not a huge Stephen King reader. Um, uh, and then – sort of got into a bigger discussion and it was just fascinating it so was, there's no annotated dark tower series coming from you yet. well well he said um actually steven and i have talked about doing um, an annotated edition of the stand and we are waiting for the publisher to say go um oh so i don't we'll think see. you'd have to worry about sales uh we'll no see. one tell my hey, wife about the show i Mike, you know, hey, I'm, I'm cheap and easy, you know. <laughs> American Gods, I'm hoping, will be on the on the bestseller list. I, you know, it's, well, uh, you know, Stephen King's popular, Neil Gaiman's popular, you know. So there you go. Yes. We'll Stephen think, King's well, just popular. That's all. He's, yeah. he's only popular. Yeah, yeah, he's he's if he keeps working hard, he'll make it. Yeah. Well, I did a panel uh, two nights ago with uh, Joe Hill. Panel. It was an in conversation with Joe at uh, the Poison Pen Bookstore, which is on their website, uh, which was really fun. Uh, and we talked about his career and comparisons to that other writer, he said, who had just written, they said he had just read this book by this other writer called The Institution that he thought was pretty good. And uh, the guy had a long potential career ahead of him. Uh, so you can catch that somewhere out there. It was a fun conversation about horror and the H word and why publishers don't want to use it and where the books go into bookstores and so on. Well, I mean, even Stephen King himself, he says he doesn't see himself as a horror writer. He's a science fiction writer, which is sometimes true. I mean, with the Institute, it was true. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, but it's, it is interesting. Well, that... And then of course, the science fiction writers say, we don't write science fiction, we write speculative. Oh, oh yes. Yes. That's yeah. true. Yeah. All right, real quick, uh, somebody in the audience said that my mic wasn't working properly. Can you guys hear me okay? What, Just fine. I, all right. It's fine. I was reminding Joe. Joe, of course, started as a comic book writer. And yeah. um, I asked him if he knew the story about uh, Neil Gaiman tells about how he was at a cocktail party early in his career when Sandman was coming out, I guess. And some guy, this was in London, some guy introduced to him comic book writer Neil Gaiman they chat for five minutes the guy walks away half an hour later the guy comes back and says you didn't tell me you wrote graphic novels <laughs> okay so I, I I gotta tuck into that right now um, I hosted Neil Gaiman as my guest of honor at, at Tropicon in Florida back in uh, 1999 and Afterwards, I was excoriated by the science fiction community. How dare you drag a comic book writer into a <laughs> literary convention? Well, if I can cut in for a second. If, Please if, do. If anybody hasn't uh, read the annotated Sandman books, that's one of the really rich parts of them is that you have a lot of the things from Neil's scripts, which otherwise people wouldn't get to see how beautiful and elaborate and fascinating they are. Yeah, like as an artist, couldn't I agree love. More. Ahead, I couldn't sorry. agree more. The, 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 yeah. Neil learned from Alan, uh, both of them, they are essentially long, long letters to the artist. Uh, and I love Neil's because Neil's go on about things like, oh, the baby's throwing up in the other room. I guess I got to take a break here. Uh, and that'll be in the script. Uh, and uh, and the Alan Moore dynamic with, with uh, Dave Gibbons was really interesting, too, because Dave tells very freely that he would get Alan's scripts. You know, Alan would have 
six pages about one single panel. And Dave would go through it, highlight a few things, and then do what he wanted. And the truth is that the great writers, Alan and Gaiman, have both said repeatedly in their scripts and publicly that they, when they know the artist, they trust the artist, they give them this elaborate script and then say, but if you have any better ideas yourself, do it. Well, I can tell you as an artist, that's perfect because you need the five elaborate pages of what the art, the author's thinking before you can think of a totally different thing to do for them that will be perfect, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah. But like, yeah, you get a sense of exactly what your author needs when they do that. So The other amazing thing about those scripts, um, to me, was the depth of research that both Alan Moore and Neil Gaiman were doing for monthly comic books. You know, they were doing this incredible amount of research and, and putting it in, putting it on the page I and mean, putting this wonderful historical material on the page. All right, guys. Uh, sorry about the, I don't know what happened, frozen. I don't oh, it know. went much better without you, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, no well, doubt. Welcome back, though. No doubt. Can I, I, I just want to ask a Lovecraft-related question. Please, what? this is no, the Lovecraft this... e-zine, isn't it? Might as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, have you ever considered doing a third volume of uh, revisions and collaborations? No. You know, I, the reason is, Rick, I'm, it's so difficult to have any certainty about what's Lovecraft and what's somebody else that I just have been too nervous doing that. I, I mean, I might find myself carrying on about something and somebody else is going to finally prove, no, Lovecraft didn't write anything, any part of that paragraph or whatever. Um, so you're you're right. I've stayed away from the revisions, um, and I just they make me very nervous uh, about whether they're sort of canonical or not. Um, I just don't think. Now, I mean, there are some exceptions. Clearly, under the pyramids is uh, is in a sense a revision, a hundred percent written by Lovecraft under somebody else's name. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before before anyone leaves or has to go uh i i did want to ask about the um the amazing public service you did in the lawsuit about sherlock holmes yeah and have, that was the other thing uh my professor wanted me to ask about because that really that was a very like no one wanted to touch that subject right is it really in the public domain if two of the, was it two of the stories or oh no 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 so there are 60 stories 50 of them were in the public domain when we brought the suit. And now there are, there's one more that's in the public domain now and there'll right. be more next year. Um, so yeah, but you're absolutely right. The issue was whether having 10 stories still in copyright meant that they controlled the character. Uh, and what the court said um, was, no, they could only protect the elements that appear in the copyrighted stories exclusively, which is virtually nothing. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, you said I don't know if you said public service. I thought of, I mean it turned it was pretty foolhardy. Uh, when we started the case, we thought, oh, this is going to be easy and inexpensive and all that. And then the estate was just relentless. And as you know, we had to go to the Supreme Court. Uh, and fortunately, uh, the court awarded us all of our legal fees in the case. So, but otherwise it would have been very expensive. But I say public service because I mean, that's, as we said, we, this is the most adapted character and it doesn't yes. just affect Sherlock Holmes. I mean, this Absolutely. potentially affects Lovecraft. It affects- Well, it affects, it affects, I mean, we already know that it affects uh, Zorro, uh, Hercule Poirot. Uh, these are, these are uh, uh, John Carter of Mars, Tarzan. These are all characters that have stories in the public domain and not in the public domain. So one of the dream projects I have, and I have boxes and boxes of material, I want to do a biography of Charlie Chan. Okay. And, you know, that's a huge undertaking. Yes. But, um, have you seen my uh, classic American crime fiction? I have. I love Charlie Chan. I mean, I love that novel. I was just yeah. I'm really interesting. And uh, I was first sort of hooked on the idea of Chan when I read uh, Yunti Wong's uh, uh, 
book about Jan and about sort of the history of how it had been written and all that. But yeah, that's ripe for doing. Um, Tarzan's been done. Holmes has been done. Nero Wolf has been done, but nobody's done Charlie Jan. Well, yeah. Pete is a movie aficionado rather than a uh, figures aficionado. Well, there's plenty to say about the movies too. Yeah. Uh, but there's a bunch of books. What are there, 14 novels or something like that? Yeah, um, and I've got comic strips, radio plays. Um, there's a bunch of... When I started, you know, I can remember watching the shows on, on the Midnight Theater, but then I discovered the the uh, the television show uh, and had to shell out some money for bootleg DVDs. There, yes. You know, there are, there are serious discussions to be had about sort of political correctness and absolutely uh, the racial sensitivities but i mean i i wanted to include that book um that novel in my book precisely because um this was a terrible time for asians back in the 19 mid 1920s it was a terrible time it was a time when the united states government said the immigration the immigration quota for asians is zero zero no new Asian immigrants, and um, and Chan was in Hawaii where there was a large uh, Japanese population. And he was in a minority Chinese population, and the the racial implications of the story are really interesting to me as a reminder, of sort of where we were, and that this whole immigration stuff is nothing new. Right. Right. Yeah. No, it, I mean people don't realize how bad the Chinese Exclusion Act was and how. I mean, it wasn't just like, oh, we had these random Japanese internment camps in World War II out of nowhere. There was there was a 60-year history or 70-year history leading up to that. Of, Correct. Um, pretty, I mean, they were treated the worst of any minority. Absolutely. Um, by a large margin. I mean, even the escaped slaves and you know African Americans were treated as superior to the Chinese and the Japanese at the time. Um, so it's it's. Un Maybe it's good that we've moved past it, but it's unfortunate that it's also kind of ignored or forgotten. Yes. So, when, you know, I mean, I was going to say with uh, the Lovecraft stories, um, and your next project is American Gods. Um, have you talked to DC about maybe doing like some of the classic Batman works? Uh, I, I have DC a list. DC is I can give very you. difficult. DC does not like being solicited. Um, when uh, Watchmen came about in kind of a funny way I, I was out there we were finishing up Sandman and I was having lunch with the editor and I said to him you know my dream project would be to do annotated Watchmen and he said you know we don't accept solicitations uh, and I said I said oh okay um, and then he said so why don't you send us a proposal <laughs> that wasn't then I wasn't soliciting them they were soliciting me so I uh, did uh, and it went nowhere. I heard absolutely nothing for six months. And then I was talking to the same editor about something relating to Sandman. And he said, oh, we're going ahead with Watchmen. And I said, with me? He said, well, yes. It's like, okay. <laughs> um, so what else is there out there? I don't know. In the comic book world, the frankly, I, I gave some serious thought to doing an annotated edition of Mouse and talked it over with my wife and she said Les do you really want to spend a year or two with your head in the holocaust and I said uh, you're right and I said okay don't want to do that but um, there's you know to do a comic book it has to be literate and that's the distinguishing features of Sandman and Watchmen, is they're so rich um, and so minutely detailed with references to culture and history and literature, et cetera. I mean, I could do, although it's been done by somebody else, I could do the annotated League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Jess Nevins. But Jess Nevins has done it brilliantly. Yeah, I want to say Jess Nevins covered almost everything I can think of. Actually, I was thinking Kingdom Absolutely. Come, but Jess Nevins did, a, online at least, he had a... Yes. Really and by the way, there were some online annotations of Watchmen that I certainly looked at when I was doing Watchmen. Um, they weren't very deep, um, but they were helpful. I, I don't, I mean, I freely admit I'm not the world's greatest expert on sort of the complete history of comics. And so, um, 
odd references to bizarre English comic book characters, etc. You know, I picked those up from other people. Right, but you you did mention you know that Alan and Neil were delivering scripts where they were spending weeks doing research yes. on how to support this stuff, and this feeds into, as you brightly said, not only allows you to do an annotated edition, but necessitates the annotated edition. Yes, because yes. I mean, you know, one of the fun things I did with with Neil with Sandman was, um, you know, his scripts didn't have. Uh, footnotes <laughs> right. this didn't have citations so in many cases I was trying to deduce the source material for things and Neil was very kind let me come to his house and spend a few days there and sort of wander through his library and all that and it was like yes there's that book that I knew he had and so on it was uh, it was a lot of fun to do that yeah it, you know and a lot of us in Lovecraft and with Neil and Alan Moore, we don't read the same things that were read. We don't read, very few of us read Pliny or Clooney. Right. And, no and, one's reading the old Charleston comics that Watchmen was primarily. Right. Or Plutarch's Lives. Uh, right. I haven't read that recently. You know, uh, that features prominently in Sandman and yes. uh, and, and so on. Um, I, uh, yeah. I, so many years ago, I wrote a, a monograph on. Uh, Joseph Campbell imagery in Neil Gaiman's Sandman. And, you know, nobody reads Campbell anymore. They watch the documentary, but they yeah, don't that's, read. That's Campbell. a shame. Exactly. Of course, you know, my Campbell shelf is, what, four feet long? You know, because if you have to have the complete works, it's huge. Right. Well, Gaiman has said, by the way, I mean, it was uh, one of my little pleasures is that for years he's been saying, as people have asked him, Who's this god? Who's that god? Yep. Wait for the Les Klinger annotation. Neil had nice. his brain a long time before I did. <laughs> yeah, because I, I mean, I can think of a very specific character that that'll probably be very helpful with. Um, but now, you know, now that we have Pete Rollick, uh, writer extraordinaire, who's written such wonderful works as The Weird Company and Reanimators and Reanimatrix, those are very literary. There you go. Sort of stories like yeah. those could use a less clinger. There know, you go. Well, uh, I, I, I would say make me an offer, Pete. <laughs> you know what? You, I'll, I'll, I'll get your email address from Mike. I'll send you a copy of the, of the books, um, because it's just a love letter to Pulp Fiction. You well, know, thanks. I, I, another, another example like that. I'm sure you all uh, uh, love are Kim Newman's books. Um, who is one of my primary inspirations. Kim is uh, Kim's a good friend, and his books are just so rich uh, with stuff that you just you know that that person is somebody, and yes. you want to find out more about them. Yeah, Kelly Young is nuts about those books. He's trying to get me to read them. I need to do Nano that. Nano Dracula books are just amazing. Yeah. Well, one of the fascinating things to me was that it, 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 from the very get go, um, Kim had as one of his major characters in Anno Dracula. Um, uh, Kate Reed. Now, Kate Reed is not a name that is known to 98% of Dracula fans in the world because she only appears in the manuscript. She was cut from the published version. Right. So I've never really buttonholed Kim to ask him sort of how, where did he come across Kate Reed? Uh, I mean, he clearly did not see the manuscript because there's only been, I think, two or three of us who have ever seen it yeah i was uh, gonna say i don't think i don't i mean wasn't the manuscript lost for a while like i yes. i, I want to say there was a facility maybe kim had it who knows <laughs> maybe he had it in his underwear drawer for a long time right? <laughs> yeah no it was discovered in the 70s i think um and then this guy at, at a bookstore called book sale had it for many years and then finally sold it to at, at auction in the late 90s uh to paul allen but that was after a, a solid portion of the Anno Dracula stuff was written. So yes, yes. So I, I've never asked him where he got that. Another Kim uh, anecdote. So in one of the um, one of his stories about the Diogenes Club, uh, he has his character Charles uh, serving as the technical advisor for a film about Sherlock Holmes. It's the John Barrymore film, and. 
there's a scene in the story where Charles is saying to the film director, you know, you showed the outside of Holmes's residence and it says 221B. And we know that it should just say 221 because B was the apartment number. And I said to Kim, did you make that up? He said, yeah. I said, that exact thing happened to me on the Downing Oh, <laughs> We had that exact same conversation. Art imitates life, imitates art, or one of those. All right, well, I apologize for my new mic to the audience. It looks like it's new not mic, working Mike. out. New mic, Mike has a new mic that's not working out. So, hey, did while I was gone, did we cover this at all? The new annotated no. HP logo. We need another two hours. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I want to, let me say, let me let me throw in one or two small pitches for it. As, as, sure. Uh, only because I want to talk just briefly about the stories and and the supplemental materials. So um, the stories. Not all the stories are what I would call big stories. Um, there's stories in there like Ex Oblivioni and uh, the transition of one, uh, what's his name, the, the, whatever his name is, well, and no. so on. These are not the most popular stories, but I thought that they were high quality material that shows Lovecraft's transition. So the last story, they're in chronological order in, in the book, and the last one is Dream Quest. Um, which is kind of where that's sort of when after that he gets really good um, that isn't to say that these are bad stories some of them are terrific stories we were the outsider rats in the wall Arthur German um, you know etc some some really good stories uh, um, is the horror uh, red hook in there by yes, the red hook is in there the cat the cats of Ulthar, um the old god the the other gods um, etc so there's there's 25 stories in the book. I mean, what I left out were things like, yes, Sweet Ermengarde is not in there. Sorry. Uh, uh, there's one or two sort of what I would think of as minor, minor stories that are not in the book. Um, so it's not complete, but it's pretty complete. Um, supplemental material. Somebody said online somewhere, well, he just reprinted stuff from the first volume wrong absolutely false um, the tables are all new there is a table of the stories in the order written which is very different from the table in the first book which had a table of them in the, in the order published um, and there is a and, and there's a gazetteer I was a little surprised to find that nobody had done a gazetteer for Lovecraft a gazetteer meaning a listing and brief description of every single geographic place mentioned in every single story um, so that's in the back um, as well as an interesting essay about the incantation uh, that appears in the horror of Red Hook um, and Lovecraft's own sort of analysis of that and so on so so I mean now that you mentioned the horror of Red Hook someone in the chat was actually asking um, how you addressed the less savory aspects of Lovecraft the extreme rate I mean that story in particular I, I'd, I'd like to say head on um, I mean I, I tweeted on his birthday happy birthday to uh, one of the most despicable geniuses of our century um, you know he, he was a racist he was um, an anti-semite he it's I you know maybe we could say it's not his fault I don't think that's <laughs> really true but we could say that it's not his fault a product of his generation a product of his community and all that but you know he should have done better he should have been a better person but he wasn't yeah. um, but so Gaiman and I had a public conversation uh, it may be on the net somewhere about an hour long maybe three four years ago uh, longer than that five years ago um, about Lovecraft and his racism and his stories and all that and and Neil and I both tried to make the point that if you take it the racism powers the stories um, Lovecraft took his racist anti-immigrant anti anybody who wasn't just like him feelings and made them universal and that's the genius of the story we all do feel afraid of the other um, now, hopefully our definition of the other is a lot 
narrower than his. Um, you know, I probably would be afraid of some being from another planet. Um, maybe, maybe not. But uh, you take out it, that racism and you the stories turn into sort of not very interesting. Uh, the other thing that I think is important to keep in mind and face with Lovecraft, and, and actually my editor said to me, she had never read Lovecraft when she started editing uh, the first volume. And she said when she read the bio and realized that both of his parents had died in an insane asylum, this was a man who was petrified that he also was tainted and going to go insane. And so those feelings also are deep, deeply embedded in all these stories. The taint of blood, the, you know, the genetic defects, all those things. I'd like to say the man's write, writing should be appreciated without reference to who he was, because um, that's the way I feel about art in general. But I think it's interesting. You got to admit here that he is not somebody. He's not a poster boy of of uh, good citizenship. No, and you're it, and you're right. It boils down to fear. So. And I yeah, say, I mean it's pretty valuable to see someone who's that consumed by fear because it can help you understand some people who now are acting completely irrationally because of their similar fears to his. I mean, it's good to see somebody like that. And if anyone other, you know, I, I highly recommend people uh, look up Victor Laval's NPR interview um, when he discussed the Ballad of Black Tom because he, he also confronts his head on and Victor Laval is a person of color and um, he sort of describes his background where he read Lovecraft. He didn't realize how bad Lovecraft was the first time he read it because he was a teenager and he sort of missed all the clues and then reading it later and sort of learning and, and the way he talks about it, um, I thought that was a really wonderful personal kind of explanation because it's easy for a bunch of white guys to sit here and talk about how we should overlook this or treat it a certain way, but to have someone that's actually affected or you know, personally feels connected to some of the things he's saying give their opinion. So I, I, it's a, I'll link it in the YouTube chat. But right, it's, and um, it's also, by the way, Victor did, Mike knows this because he's holding the book, Victor wrote an introduction for my edition and talks about some of those same themes. Yeah, and, uh, and I believe he said that at age 15, when he realized all of this, he threw all of his Del Rey's away. So and it took him a while. And now he probably wishes he had him back. Probably, but, you know. probably yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Having come to terms... Well, when I spoke to him at Necronomicon, um, the one thing that stuck out in my memory is he described uh, Lovecraft as like the old crazy uncle you have that did a lot of good things in his life, but then you you can't ignore like the really horrible things he would sometimes say, and you need to go, hey, you know, let, let's let's correct this. We don't want to pretend you didn't say this, but it's also not fair to sort of throw out everything just because of that. And I think, like I said, I'd. I hope people will read the, or listen to the interview he gave because it's he's much more articulate and brilliant than I am, and he's also directly affected by this. Um, but it's I I thought I, I think it's important. Like so, you said in the book, you directly address, ex, excuse me, uh, directly address it, and I'm looking forward to reading that because I think that's always the fear is that someone's going to cover a story like the horror at Red Hook and just sort of gloss over or lightly reference. You know, the Shadow Over Innsmouth is a perfect example. I mean, that's about mixed race breeding. Oh, you take most... the racism out, there's no story there. Yeah, yeah but... there's, there's other stories with similar problems. Um, stories like He or, um, you know, uh, Cool Air, etc. Many stories have racial slurs or, or very blunt points of view. Uh, the Terrible Old Man. Um, A little transition of Juan Romero again. Yes. Call of Cthulhu, yeah. One of the things that I, you mentioned the Shadow of Rins of uh, Ben, and I, you know, I I think I've talked about this before. I actually see some hope in the Shadow of Rins myth, and to me, it's a rewrite of Arthur German. It deals with many of the same issues. I think but that's a very good point. In in Arthur German, the 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 appropriate response is to set everything, including yourself, on fire and destroy it. The response in Shadow of Rinsmith is very different. Right, to it's embrace it. It's ex it, in many ways, it's a transhuman story. And not only to embrace it, but to acknowledge that I will d dwell in wandering glory forever. That's a very different reaction 
and it's it's a course of 20 what 20 years mm -hmm. but you know yes it's still a racist story but the conclusion is so different that i'm it but it's but it's back to lovecraft's insistence on um i'm not i'm just isolation uh, sort of i'm trying to not assimilation is okay isolation is okay isolation meaning put all the black people in liberia you know that's right. good right uh uh this is gonna yeah, uh, joke, but. you know if you get a chance uh read the articles about missing uh, the the missignation word yeah. and how it was all made up and it's actually you know from what i understand i've talked to jeff shanks the anthropologist about this is that what they were afraid of in crossbreeding that you would produce a superhuman. And that's why it was outlawed. Interesting, okay. And the original paperwork that came out saying that this is a bad thing, and this is during the Lincoln uh, election, was that if we allow this to happen, because every time this has happened in the past, the resulting population has been smarter, faster, and stronger. If we allow this to happen, we will be replaced. Hmm. So we got to stop it. Right. And that's a very different fear. That is, that's, that's like, that's so that's some real X Men crap going on there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Les, before we let you go, I noticed that you just did a, uh, a book with Lisa Morton. Ghost yes. stories, classic tales of horror and suspense. Um, so, yeah, uh, stories is, that have uh, been overlooked. It says, "Can you talk right, about that?" This, yeah, this is a uh, this is one of my pet project lines. Um, I started it um, maybe ten years ago with a book called "In the Shadow of Sherlock Holmes." Uh, I did another one called "In the Shadow of Dracula." Uh, later, "In the Shadow of Edgar Allan Poe," and then after that, "In the Shadow of Agatha Christie." And I, ghost hand, I was going to say the in the shadow of Agatha Christie. I'm going to actually hand to my professor uh, later this week. Great, because uh, and, and ghost stories. Looking. I could we couldn't quite say in the shadow of uh, ghost or in the shadow of. I th we we thought about titling it in the shadow of M R James and then said, uh, let's see. There's a lot of people who don't know who M R James is. So in the shadow cast. Well, if they don't, I'm going to go to their house and punch them in the face. But okay. Anyway, continue. So the idea okay. of this book, just as those previous books, was to try and bring to attention uh, writers who have been underappreciated, um, uh, forgotten, overlooked, whatever words you want to say, uh, and primarily in the ghost field where I I wanted to do this. Um, Lisa was who is a, a good friend was clearly the right partner uh, having written a book called ghosts which is a non-fiction book um, about the history of ghosts um, and uh, we're just finishing uh, a book that'll be out in january called weird women which is uh, same thing forgotten underappreciated underestimated uh, women's horror of the 19th and early 20th century um, and we have a, a some other ideas too uh, along those lines so i love doing this i love finding and by the way as i've said many times that laurie king and i have done four anthologies that i love um, those are stories inspired by the sherlock holmes canon but those are with live writers these are dead writers and dead writers are so much easier to work with <laughs> uh any other questions for Les before we let him go Okay. I'll ask. I'll, I'll ask one. All right. Have you ever considered doing an annotated Phantom of the Opera? Yes, and actually, thank you, Rick, for letting me plug another project. <laughs> so we have just announced uh, that Poison Pen Press and the Horror Writers Association is putting out a new series called The Haunted Library. Uh, this is uh, the reissue of horror classics. Um, I would describe them as curated rather than annotated, lightly annotated uh, introductions by well-known horror writers, uh, supplemental material of discussion group questions, um, suggested further reading, uh, 
And we have six titles already uh, sort of in the works. Uh, Eric Guignard and I are co-editing that series. Uh, the first volume is The Phantom of the Opera. It will be out in January. Uh, and the second volume is The Beetle by Richard Marsh. Uh, the third is Vatek by William Beckford. Uh, volume four will be House on the Borderland by William Hope Hodgson. Oh. Uh, volume five is The Parasite and Other Tales of Terror by Arthur Conan Doyle. And the last one is The King in Yellow. And there'll be more, we hope. And those These are going to be paperbacks aimed at mass market. Right, and a, but a uniform edition. Yes. Real nice. Well, the King in Yellow, are you reprinting the exact contents of the first volume? Because most of those were in ghost stories. Are you? Are you I think, uh, you know, we're going to, yeah, we're trying to stay true to the originals here. And uh, uh, Ramsey Kim is, I think, writing the introduction for uh, the Hodgson book. Uh, I've forgotten who's doing the King in Yellow. Uh, Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough has done the introduction for, uh, for The Beetle. Uh, Joe Lansdale did the introduction for uh, uh, Vatek. Dan Stashauer, um, a dear friend of mine, I reached out and asked Dan if he would do the introduction for The Parasite and the other Doyle stories, he being the great Doyle biographer. Um, so I'm, we're very excited about that. And since you asked, Rick, I should also mention <laughs> I am also general editor of a series that uh, we just issued the press release on uh, last week. It's completely unrelated to this. It's called the Library of Congress Crime Classics. Uh, and it is sort of the mirror to the British Library's new series of Golden Age classics that they've been putting out with Martin Edwards as the editor. Uh, again, um, uniform editions, Pete, um, you know, sort of trade paperbacks aimed at wide readership. The first volume is Anna Catherine Green's That Affair Next Door. Uh, the second volume is The Rat Began to Gnaw the Rope by C.W. Grafton, Sue Grafton's father, uh, and in, in his own right, an award-winning mystery writer. And the third volume is Del Shannon's Case Pending, um, uh, set in the 1960s with a Mexican-American detective, uh, police detective. Uh, and there will be a lot more. That too is published by Poison Pen Press uh, and the Library of Congress as our partner. Well, that leads me to ask a question. Do you ever sleep? <laughs> I try not to, but it's- Because uh, you know I, what'll I, come for you if you do. Yes, uh, so, but no, this is great fun. You know, I I squeeze things in. I, today I worked on the rep again and another rope. It's, the notes are all written. I wrote the introduction today. I wrote the author biography and so on, and it's just, you know, I, it's what I do. I juggle. I'm a lawyer, so I'm used to juggling lots and lots of projects, and it's just what you do. Do you mind if I ask what kind of law specifically you focus on? Somebody said Sherlock Holmes, deductions. I do tax and estate planning and, uh, and a lot of general business work. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have a few authors as clients, not very many, because mostly they don't make enough money to need my services, but you know, one of the reasons I asked about uniform editions is that when I was researching uh, Reanimatrix, uh, I I got like four different editions of Philo Vance, and they don't you know the shelf just looks horrendous, right? <laughs> you just you need consistency. Oh, Charlie Chan, you know that those were cleaned up um, yeah. later editions. I, I left in all the references in, in my edition. I left in all the references to Japs and some of the bad words that were used um, because that's the way they came out. And yeah, and they, yeah, you should, you should. I've tried really hard to stick to the original text in all of these books. Um, and that means, unfortunately, spending all of the money I earn on buying first editions and things so that I can <laughs> carefully compare the texts. but. What can you there do? are worse things to do. That's true. Now, I'm just curious, like maybe we should have your wife on a future episode to discuss yes, what it's that would like. Be very good. When she sees you come home with a giant a you know, you come home with a stack of, you know, seven first editions that cost a few thousand dollars and she has to try to, you know, figure out how to handle this. It's a business expense. There you go. <laughs> when I wrote my first book, I said, you know, 
it's not my fault it only sold 200 copies. <laughs> I'm trying to make thousands, millions of dollars, you know? So, so this weekend, I, I just you and I were probably the only person who care about this, but I found this this weekend for a dollar. Oh, nice. Neuro my Wolf book, book. over there. And, you know, I've been looking for this for ages, right? I refuse to pay online prices. I, and I love how Les just points, like, oh, no, I've got it right I here. I got it over Fine. there. Oh, yeah. The reason it's over there is because I've been working on, I don't know if it's going to happen, but I've been working on a volume, Classic American Crime Fiction of the 30s. And obviously, Fair to Lance has to be in that volume. Absolutely. First Neuro <laughs> Wolf Mystery. So, um, yes, I built, this is why I am one of the, great money losers as a writer because every time I start a project I go out and I buy 40 books uh, not not all first editions I mean just reference books I now have probably 10 books on Nero Wolf uh, on the shelf over there I, I have a complete Nero Wolf collection only because you know I got sucked in and once you buy one you have to buy them all absolutely I get it Artists are the same way, just like writers are the best people to appreciate how wonderful books are. Artists are the ones who generally appreciate how wonderful other artists are. So we're never rich either because we really love all the art our friends make too, and we buy that. And Absolutely. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, there's a disease too that we send our books to other people. And, you know, I have, my friends are complaining about shelves. Ben, you said it. Book cancer. Earlier about the bookshelves. You know, it's like, God, I had to build in an extra wall brace to hold your latest book, Les, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Just well, a question, Les. What, what's your feeling on the Nero Wolf Sherlock Holmes theory? That, uh, <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. My, it's, uh, do you remember seeing the uh, television movie? Um, which one? It, was, uh, it wasn't It was Too Many Cooks. It was um, something, the doorbell rings. It was a yeah. TV adaptation of the doorbell rings. And there's that wonderful scene at the beginning where Archie is standing in the reception area of the of the uh, brownstone talking to the client, and behind him on the wall you see this big oil painting of Sherlock Holmes, and uh, the client says to Archie, "Oh, is it true what they say about Mr. Wolf's father?" And he opens his mouth, and then camera, you know, we cut the Nero walks in, and that's it. He never gets to answer. So yes, I love that theory. All right, well, the theory that Nero Wolf is the son of Irene Adler and Sherlock Holmes. Yes, even though she apparently died before that, but uh, we. You can... I don't know. We just had a big debate the other day about what the late Irene Adler really yeah. had. I say, I mean, I just say, so long as you address that in some way, the theory works. But most people, that's right, who, who advance it haven't addressed that. Uh, most people's explanation is all it meant was she got married. She wasn't Irene Adler anymore. She was now Irene Norton. Oh, that's a good explanation. I like that one. Yeah. yeah. Simple. She's dead to me. She's dead to you. Okay. Well, well, the, the, the other explanation is that she faked her death because Moriarty was after her. Right, because that's what people do all the time, right? So, yeah. Well, Holmes did it, so why not? Why yeah. not? Morrison did it. Already was after him. So, sorry. Well, Les, thanks for being on the show. Really My pleasure. It. I'm glad we could spend an hour and a half uh, talking, and we could have obviously got another hour and a half about sure. other things that interest us. But uh, we didn't even really get to talk about Frankenstein. What can we do? You yeah. Know? You have to be I, I tried. I tried to talk about Frankenstein. I promise. The okay. the new annotated H.P. Lovecraft is it. Is there a Kindle version for that as well, like the Sherlock Holmes? There is. Okay. There is. I have both the Kindle and I ordered the whole. I have well, by the way, I mean, as a plug for the Kindle editions, the reason that I love and carry them around myself is because I have always gone to extremes to get the highest quality source for the images that I use. So these are very high resolution images that I've sent to the publisher. Sometimes they come out as little, you know, one inch, two inch images in the book. On the Kindle, you can blow them up and see all the beautiful details of those images. Especially Lovecraft, there's some gorgeous, I mean, there's some beautiful maps and things like uh, that. Not only that, but as I mentioned before we started the show, I, I read a review of the Sherlock Holmes uh, Kindle right. versions, and I'm sure the, the same link. is true of this. Right, the hyperlinks. Yeah, that they're, that they're so well done, you know. 
in the Kindle yeah, version. You touch the note, you jump to the footnote. Right. You touch the note number, you jump back to the text, etc. Right. You don't get lost looking for them. And of course, unlike the print, prints are great. I love them, but uh, the Kindles are search searchable. Well, so. right, searchable. Uh, the, the the one drawback is you can't use it as a doorstop. So. <laughs> and you don't own it. I, but uh, I I'm not things. getting into that again. The what? only the only disadvantage I see with a Kindle is if you have a wonderful table like your Gazetta, it's easy to read that in a printed book. That's true. But I'll say this. I live in Los Angeles. My wife literally put a moratorium on purchasing more physical copies of books. Oh, don't done. tell my wife that. You I'm need to get rid of that wife. Part out of the show, so. <laughs> you just have to find a wife who accepts you for what you are. Now, it, it'll it'll be 15 years in just a couple of weeks here. I can't I can't do that. It's too late now. It's over. Okay, but no, that guys. was the thing is, ebooks. I can buy all the ebooks in the world because they all fit. You know, I mean, I've got maybe five gigs of Kindle books. I don't know, but. Well, you know, they don't take up any space. That's a thumb drive. Floating right? wall shelves, man. They're cheap. I'm going to start peppering no. my entire house with them. I, th that's I think what I was that's going to work. Right above me, I have a giant shelf. It's just Batman trade paperbacks. I had to put extra braces in because it's so heavy. It's not even that simple anymore. <laughs> I, I have up above my desk here, I have across the room shelving. Of just, and those are just my books up there. Just the ones I've written. And uh, there's, it's. I'm afraid one of these days is just going to all come crashing down. Well, thanks for being on the show, Les. My uh, pleasure, guys. You, you're just you're uh, watching on your browser, right? Yes. Okay, so all you got to do is close your browser, and you'll be it'll it'll exit you. Okay. Thanks, thanks so, so much. much. Really it appreciate was great. it. Great. Thanks a lot. See you again soon. Have Take care. Night. All right. Thanks. You too. Thank you. Uh, all right, folks. Sorry I'm about. Real, the, I I you have to go, go too, well, don't you? But uh, that was one of the best things that ever happened. So I'm not going to complain. <laughs> Everyone have a nice day. You too. Bye. Thanks, Ben. Good night, Ben. One thing I wanted to mention during the Dracula, but we went into another subject, is on YouTube I discovered there is a uh, BBC audio drama called The Unquenchable Thirst of Dracula, and it's an adaptation by Mark Gatiss, who played played Mycroft on uh, Sherlock, yeah. of an unproduced Hammer film set in the 30s with Dracula's in India. Hmm. And it's very well done. It, it, it has the faults of a traditional Dracula Hammer movie, I'll say that. But it is fun if you're a Hammer aficionado or just a horror aficionado. That's awesome. Well, I even liked the Frank Langella Dracula, but I think it's because he was pretty. So I'm going to be honest with myself and just admit that. All right, so question, you know, uh... As we all know, Google Hangouts committed suicide, so we've 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 had to make do. When we were frozen, were were I was frozen for a while. Were you guys frozen for a while, or was it just a minute or so? Uh, we did, we it, we weren't frozen. Good. It took us a while to notice that you were. Okay. Yeah, I don't yeah, care about sorry, that. As man. long as the I, I was wondering if the conversation continued or if there was some conversation. Yeah. Continued. Yeah. All right. That that's awesome. All right. Uh, we are professionals. We can carry the load. Yes, I know, and I appreciate it. And um, people who are watching, give me some feedback on how the microphone sounds now. Sounds like I need to switch microphones again. So, But we'll do our best for the rest of the show. I wanted to talk about a few books that I'm reading or and or have on my TBR. Uh, in my TBR. Uh, Brian Hodges, I'm 57% I'm, I'm through. I'll bring you the birds from out of the sky. Uh, this is an amazing cosmic horror book, so I I really recommend it. Um, let's see what I will. Oh, John Horner Jacobs, who we're going to have on in a couple of weeks, sent me this: a lush and seething hell, and it's two John Horner Jacobs. Uh, I was gonna say novellas, but this is this is kind of thick. Anyway, two stories, two novels or novellas, uh, with a foreword by Chuck Wendig. So I'm looking forward to this too. Uh, other thing I'm reading, I'm actually rereading this, is a book called *The Harrowing* by Alexander Sokoloff. And 
it's subtitled a ghost story but I guess just read it is all I can say because there's more to it than that um, have you read that one Pete? I have not yeah have she's not. a great writer uh, so there's three of them uh, Doug Wynn has this out now Smoke and Dagger uh, a Spectre Files prequel yeah so check that out he wants to give away some copies sometime in the next few weeks so there's that too um did you guys all read the institute stephen king i have not yet i have not but i watched in the tall grass i watched in the tall grass too uh and i'm sorry that i did is that on netflix yes it is on netflix. did did you like it pete I, you know, it's it's. It, I thought it hit all the notes that I expected for a Netflix adaption of a Stephen King book to, to hit. It was. It reminded me of of what they've done before. Um, it's not a great movie. It probably would have tanked in the at the box office. But as a made for television movie, it was above average. So I read yeah. the story and they kept the really gross part in the uh, adaptation. Okay. Yeah. So, I, you know, I thought it was okay, but I didn't think it was great. And if Stephen King and Joe Hill's names weren't on it, I don't know that we'd be really talking about it much. No, in many ways, it could, I, I, I think I Facebooked about this, that it, to me it reminded me of, you know, it's a rewrite of Children of the Corn, Mixed with um, what, fourteen oh eight, the Lawnmower Man, and uh, the Lonely Death of Jordy Verrill. Well, oh, shoot! I guess I'm gonna have to watch it then. I mean, it's 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 okay. Did you, Pete? Did you think it was a bit Lovecraftian because of the uh, uh, the uh, stone? I think that. It's as Lovecraftian as, say, Tommy Knockers is. Yeah. Okay. Well. You know, if you if you were to interpret it as Lovecraftian, you could interpret it as Lovecraftian. But in many ways, it's a typical Stephen King thing. Yeah. There's more Arthur Mackie. Yes. That. Sure. Um. You know, there's a thing, and it's doing things, and people don't know how to react, and it's doing you know it it's 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 a stephen king uh story yeah was well, it like justin jeffrey people the monolith type stuff going on or uh, well, you just have to watch it we don't want to yeah. give away too much okay um the institute yeah. i read it uh kelly young keeps saying how much he loves it uh i thought the beginning was very good really held me i thought the the climax, the action sequences, the last few chapters were very good. It really dragged towards the middle, in my opinion. Um, there's a lot of Stephen King books that I've read more than once. This this won't be one of them. <laughs> uh, now, he's got a book coming out called If It Bleeds soon. I don't know the date. And that's four novellas like uh, he did with... Different Seasons? It was it different seasons? Okay. The interesting thing is that one of these stories is a sequel to The Outsider, if you guys have read that one. Okay. So, and I did enjoy The Outsider. So, um, anyway, yeah. I, I'm looking forward to it for, for that alone. We have anything else to talk about? I've got some things on the list here, too, but we can get to some of them next week. Let me, let me just plug some things. Necronomicon Press reprinted Peter Cannon's uh, chronology uh, out of time and Joan Stanley's uh, Miskatonic uh, library book. Yeah, Ex, Ex Libris Miskatonicae. Okay. Yeah. And, and now it's, uh, it's sort of like, I, I guess it's hardcover technically. Yeah. They're more, more like thin books. They, they're like... Uh, more like a Dr. Seuss style hardcover. Yeah. Like <coughs> yeah. Uh, oh, speaking of Stephen King again, he I think he tweeted that Marianne on Netflix 
was really, really scary and really well done. Um, a, it's not a movie, it's a series. limited series. Yeah. Uh, man. I just finished watching something called Glitch. Eh, I couldn't stories. get into Glitch. Yeah, it's, it's a little slow burn. It's about bringing the dead back to life, but yeah. last season it gets into a little bit of cosmic horror. Oh. Yeah. So. Well, I could not get into Marianne, so... Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know why. Um, creep Show. Rick, Rick, you've been watching Creep Show? No, I haven't. The first one was not very good. I haven't seen the second one yet. Uh... I hate to keep mentioning Kelly's, Young, Kelly Young's name. He's going to get a big head. But he said the second one was much better. Um, and, of course, switch topics. I'm very excited about Brandon Routh and Kingdom Come Superman. So. All right. We'll see. We're also going to get the Smallville Superman, too. I don't know if he's going to dress up. I don't know if he's going to, just going to be uh, Clark Kent uh, or what. I've seen, I think I've seen a photo of him. He looks very different now that he's older. Yeah, he does. And I saw him in this, and, and, and I, it took me a while to recognize him. So, yeah, we'll have three Superman on that, that, uh, that crossover. Which, the crossovers is the, are the only shows of, of the only CW shows that I watch. So. There's some speculation that Linda Carter might play somebody else other than the president of the Supergirl universe. I, I heard she was going to play Wonder Woman. Yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah. But I don't know if it's been confirmed. It was rumors. Well, they are really going all out. So I hope it turns out all right. I'm just wondering who Burt Ward's going to play. <laughs> Forgot about him. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, that was great talking to Les. Yeah. Um, to the audience, sorry for the glitches. I'll get it fixed by next week. But I hope you enjoyed the show. Um, and if you didn't, well, too bad. Well, you know, you could always join the Patreon, and I can afford a better quality mic. So yeah, see, you guys are falling down on the job. You know, <laughs> we really need to step it up here. We need more hustle. No, it's more a matter of acclimating everything to the new software. So there's bound to be glitches for the first few weeks. So, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, next week, I don't remember who we have. Uh, give me a second, I'll tell you. And then we'll let everybody go. Um, you guys have anything else you need to plug? No. Things are going good. All my Kickstarters have been blessed. Good. Yeah. Uh, I've just been watching animes about like zombies who come back to form pop idol bands, so I'm afraid that's not very Stygian. So. <laughs> oh, that's right. Ellen Datlow is going to be on the show next week to talk about her very thick anthology called Echoes. It's about it's uh, ghost ghost, story. ghost stories. And then October 20th, John Horner Jacobs, and then October 27th, the Halloween show. Which I think everyone looks forward to every year. So, all right, guys, thanks. Um, and we will see you next week. Thanks for listening. <laughs>